Hello, everyone. Uh, I am a teacher, a professor here at UMKC, and uh, I have a lab in which we, and I and my graduate students, work on, well, we work on a lot of things. One of the things we work on is insulin and trying to make it, uh, come up with new ways of delivering insulin. And so I'm really a chemist, a chemist who works at the interface of chemistry and biology. And um, that process started a long time ago for me, over 30 years ago. This is when I was uh, young and naive, freshman at MIT uh, as a chemistry major. And in my, um, they told me to be patient. <laughs> uh, and uh, I had this sort of blissful expression on my face. Uh, this is a, my uh, food services uh, <laughs> uh, card. I had this blissful expression on my face. I, I think it's because I was becoming enamored with experimental science. So when I was in high school, I discovered this book called The Chemical Rubber Company Handbook of Chemistry and Physics. And in the CRC Handbook of Chemistry and Physics, I know there are a few of you in the audience who have your very own, uh, they have pages and pages of these chemical structures. And I used to look at these and just wonder at them, the, the beauty of them, the symmetry of them. I had no idea what they were. I had no idea who made them, how these things were made, or what they were used for, but I knew they were beautiful, and I wanted to know something about them. So, uh, and that's, that's the cover of my book. Uh, and so within about a year of getting to college, I got into a lab, and I would definitely recommend any uh, young budding scientist who's interested in science really should get into a lab, because it's very different. What I found was all those things I had learned, that two-dimensional stuff, in books, the very flat information really came alive in, in the lab. Why? Because all that stuff that's in the books is really describing physical reality. And when you get in the lab, you're interacting with physical reality. And it turns out, if you understand those concepts, you can, you can interact with it uh, more effectively. And so at the end of those three years in that lab, I was kind of successful. I had a few patents under my belt. Here's my name. And above me is another name, John Thompson. And we all have individuals in our lives who have played critical roles. And John Thompson was my, was my mentor. He was an amazing guy. And this is much later in life, but back then he was in his late 20s. He had come from Australia. He was a protein biochemist. And he was everything you really want in a mentor. It was just pure dumb luck on my part to run into the guy. Um, you know, I say you should choose your mentors like you carefully choose your parents. It's, it's just <laughs> pure, pure dumb luck. Um, and in his case, he was skillful and he was smart, but he was also a great teacher and had a great sense of humor, which he had to have dealing with all these undergrads running around the lab, breaking things. Um, and part of our process was to uh, sort of deconstruct what had happened in the lab at the end of the day, uh, usually in a pub, over a, a, a pitcher of Guinness. And during one of these philosophy sessions, I asked John, you know, why did you come to the United States? I mean, you know, it's a long way to go to get from Australia here, and you were very successful there. And he said, well, Simon, it's because American science is the best in the world. And it uh, kind of took me by surprise. I was 19 years old at the time. I never really thought about it. I think, you know, it's like the, the water that surrounds the fish. It's not really aware of it. Um, but as I looked around, I realized that everybody, well, not everybody, but a, a large number of the other postdocs besides John were from all different countries. And um, I just, for fun, for this talk, I pulled those old papers uh, from that time period. And these are names that I, you know, I can see their faces and hear their voices. Peter was from Switzerland. John was from Australia. Mamoru rode on the back of his motorcycle to get food. Um, he's from Japan. Jante was from India, Daniel was from Israel, Wang was from China, uh, Victor was from Russia, and um, Andreas was from Germany. So this is one small lab. We have this amazing range of people from all over the world. And you know, I thought, well, maybe that's just our lab, but it, it wasn't. I, I looked at my dorm, and this is an old uh, dorm photograph. It's on the roof. The place is called Random Hall. It was the smallest dorm. It was across from a chocolate factory uh, called the Neko Factory. So if you've ever had a Neko wafer, I lived within a few yards of that. Uh, there I am on the end. Uh, next to me, Joe Cherian from Malaysia. Next to him, Shankar from India. Down there is uh, Ricky from Peru. 
uh, Jillian from Trinidad, uh, Isaac from Ghana, Jens from uh, Sweden, and you know, when I, just some of the names, but when I went through all the countries just for, for this talk, I realized it's a huge range. There's a small group of people and an incredible variety of, of people represented, of countries represented. And, you know, I, in thinking about this, was this, was this, you know, MIT sort of experiment uh, to make a model UN of nerds? Um, <laughs> no, no. It, what, what MIT was doing on a small scale, U.S. science has been doing for the better part of a century on a large scale, and that is identify the best people wherever they are in the world and bring them into the environment of American science uh, where uh, they get the advantage of the environment and we get the advantage of their, uh, their intellect. And it doesn't just happen at MIT, it happens everywhere. This is my own division. We have eight faculty. It's a very small division. We have six countries represented. This is a pretty standard throughout uh, academia. So I would say this is the U.S. formula for science success. You get the best people, wherever they are in the world, wherever they're from, you add money, that's the water, and you get the best science in the world. Um, and uh, so, you know, I'm, I keep saying the best science in the world because that's what my mentor called it, uh, but does it actually work? Do you get the best science in the world? How do we even assess that? Well, you know, we can argue about that, but one, one way and the way I'm going to do it today is by looking at Nobel Prizes by country. And, and we can discuss, uh, you know, whether a Nobel Prize by country is the best way of assessing science overall quality, but, you know, it's not a bad proxy for the highest achievement in science. And when we do that, it's pretty clear. The United States just blows the rest of the world out of the water. We have about three times as much as the next country. Not only that, we're, we're probably more than the summation of all the other countries combined. That's about over 350 noblists. So that's great. But let's look a little bit more closely at that, that impressive bar on the bar graph. If we ask the, that's country from uh, the country they were in when they won the prize. When we ask the question of those people, how many of them uh, were not born in this country? Turns out over a hundred of them, a quarter to a third of U.S. noblists came from, they were that group, they were immigrants, they came to this country uh, to pursue science. So, um, and that's what made American science so great. So, you know, why should, I know I care because I love science, but why should an average person or, or anyone care about uh, America having the best science? Well, you know, you can have sort of a national pride thing, like in the same way that you follow the Olympics, how many gold medals each country won, and that's fine. But there's some really practical reasons to care about achievement in science. It's, one is that science and technology are an engine, or, you know, I would argue, the engine of the economy currently. And the products of science and technology can uh, really improve life. Now, I'm, I'm not a believer in, in technology being a universal panacea for our problems. There's plenty of problems um, uh, with it as well. But I think, on average, that, that is the case. And so I thought I would give as an example of, of, uh, of this idea uh, one sort of small, slender uh, chunk, a wedge of science, and that's the field of biotechnology. And biotechnology is a really American a branch of science. It came out of California. It came out of Sil near Silicon Valley, essentially. And it didn't exist until 50 years ago. Um, and it's using the tools of biology to make uh, interesting, useful biological products uh, that can, for example, uh, aid human health. So if you've ever taken a protein-based drug, they're made using the tools of biotechnology. And again, it's a field that didn't exist 50 years ago. Now, why should you care about biotechnology? Well, there's a few reasons to care about biotechnology. Uh, the first is, if you're you know, really into money, biotechnology has created trillions of dollars of economic activity in this country. It's exponentially growing, and you know, that's impressive, and it, it does spread out and affect uh, more than just the people who own these companies. Uh, the second reason to care is that you know, part of the reason that biotechnology has made that, that money or has con had that ec economic activity is because their products work. So if you've ever um, you know, had a loved one who uh, 
uh, had breast cancer, uh, they might have been given Herceptin. If you know somebody who takes insulin for, um, uh, for diabetes, all, almost, essentially all insulin is made using biotechnology. It used to be made by uh, harvesting animal organs. Uh, if you know someone who had a stroke, they probably or they might have gotten TPA or Activase, and that broke up the clot to prevent it, uh, further uh, tissue damage in the brain. So uh, these are all products of biotechnology, and they've really touched and affected uh, positively the lives of millions of people. And again, that came out of that's one piece of American science, and that truly is an, uh, a piece of American science. So we can ask the question: Well. Where did biotechnology itself come from? What were the uh, contributing, who, who invented biotechnology? And you know, this is one of the great problems in science. There's so many tributaries that lead to, uh, to any discovery that it's hard to, to point to one person. Um, but a reasonable case can be made um, for these three individuals. Uh, this is Holly, Karana, and Nuremberg. They won the Nobel Prize in 1968. And what they won for is what's called the genetic code, for determining the genetic code. And if you've ever, uh, what the genetic code is essentially is understanding how your genes, your DNA that's in your chromosomes, codes for the proteins that do all the, uh, all the actions, all, are the machines that do all the actions in the body. So if you move your arm, there's a muscle protein that's converting energy into motion. If you see something, there's a protein in your eye that's gathering light and creating a signal. Uh, those proteins are coded for by your DNA. The, how that worked was unknown until uh, these three uh, principally uh, determined it. And so this is really an example, of, and they're all American citizens. So these three neatly fit into that, that, nice, that impressive column of American noblists, three Americans in that group of 350. But let's, again, uh, complexify it if to create a word. Um, uh, they, uh, um, if we look closely at Karana, his pathway to, uh, to that contribution uh, was more uh, complex. Karana actually started in India. Uh, in fact, what, in a region of India, which is, now known, which is now Pakistan. And he was educated first, a bachelor's degree in India, in India, and then did graduate work in England at University of Manchester, postdoctoral work in Switzerland, and then eventually did further training at the University of British Columbia, and eventually made his way to the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And so, that was where he was on that day when the Nobel Prize Committee contacted him and said, congratulations, you won the Nobel Prize. And he was, at that point, an American winner of the Nobel Prize. And of course, eventually, he was recruited by MIT. Uh, and, and that's where he was, where I, I bumped into him a few times. Um, and to me, Karana, Karana's contribution to this was even more remarkable because he was really one of the first people to chemically synthesize genetic material, which is impressive. And I think I want to sort of end on, the, on talking about Karana because he's really, to me, emblematic of, the, um, of that group of 100-plus Nobel Prize winners who, American Nobel Prize winners who came from other countries. But even more so, he's emblematic of the tens and hundreds of thousands of young scientists uh, and, and engineers who've come from overseas uh, to, um, to take advantage of the uh, amazing environment of American science, but in so doing, contributing their own prodigious talents to that endeavor. And I think, uh, I think it seems uh, pretty straightforward, a straightforward idea that we should not impede that, proce that process because uh, it lies uh, at the root of the success of the scientific endeavor in the United States and of science in general. So, thank you very much.